administration meeting to order. And the first order of business is roll call. Ms. Hopper, please. Thank you, Board President. Henry Jones. Here. Margaret Brown. Present. Rob Beckner. Good morning. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma. Frank. I see you. Uh, Lisa Middleton. Present. Thank you. David Miller. David Miller. Unmute, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. Arena Ortega. It looks like we just lost her with the yellow triangle. Yep. And Jason Perez. Here. Ramon Rubicava. Present. Present. Teresa Taylor. Here. Gondola Wesley. Gondola Wesley. Lynn Chapman for Betty Yee. Here. Thank you. So I am still getting confirmation from Irena Ortega and Shonda Wesley. Shonda, please unmute. Shonda Wesley. Present. I'm here. Can you hear me? Thank you. Irena Ortega. Raina Ortega. Okay, she's got the triangle again. Oh, there you go. Raina Ortega, please unmute. Yeah, she's she's still muted. Here. Okay. okay thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the next order of business is to. Approve the April 22nd, uh, the uh, Board of Administration time agenda. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Moved by Ms. Taylor. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Brown. Okay, the Pledge of Allegiance. I've asked Mr. Raz to lead Mr. us. Mr. Chair, we have to take a roll call vote, please. Okay, uh, free roll call, please. Thank you. Margaret Brown. Aye. Rob Fickner? Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma. Frank. Oh. Okay, I see him. He's the middle. Present. Thank you. David Miller? David Miller. Hi, can you guys hear me? I guess not. Yeah, we can hear you now. And Stacey Oliveris. Thank you. Erin Ortega. Hi. Thank you. Jason Perez. Hi. Ramon Rubicava? Present. Yes. Sorry. Teresa Taylor. Yes. Shonda Wesley? Yes. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yin. Betty Yi. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hopper. So the item passes. The next item on the agenda is Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. I'm getting sound back. Okay, next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Now I've asked Mr. Perez to lead us through the pledge. Mr. Perez. All right. 
I pl pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States of America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And get, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. So if you could, uh, I don't know what's going on. Okay, I think that's better now. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'll be brief this morning. I know our CEO has a full report on our activities in response to the coronavirus. I want to congratulate my colleagues on their election as committee chairs and vice chairs. We appreciate your leadership and look forward to working with you. Again, I want to thank the team members for the outstanding work that went into planning and holding these meetings. We're pleased how smoothly things ran. And when we ran into a bump in the road, you were very quickly quick to fix it. So we really appreciate your work. As a reminder, the board will not be meeting in May. The stakeholder relations team will hold our stakeholder briefing next month as promised to keep you updated on our work. We will hold a board offsite in July, but we don't know yet what form it will take. We will keep you posted once we make that decision. Thank you for participating this week and please stay healthy and safe to you and your families. So Ms. Frost, please. CEO. Good morning, uh, President Jones and members of the board. Uh, as uh, Mr. Jones indicated, I'm going to spend the bulk of my report talking about the response uh, that we had to COVID-19 and then the key priorities um, as we were working through this uh, week by week. Um, I'll also touch on the process uh, for the, this year's healthcare premium negotiations. I know Don and Marta talked a bit about that, uh, but these would be implemented for fiscal year 2021. So we went, when we went into uh, COVID-19, we had put together a comprehensive action plan and the action plan was really surrounded by uh, the health and safety of our employees, uh, a very comprehensive communication plan out to all of the audiences, our board, the stakeholders, our members, our employees, and then the other part of the action plan was that we wanted to set a goal that we would not have degradation in any of the services that we were providing to the members. So as you heard Don report yesterday, uh, California is making some progress and flattening the curve, um, but there are still some things that need to happen. I think the last couple of days in California, as the uh, fair weather came about and people uh, perhaps ventured out more than they should have, uh, we've seen some of that data uh, get a little bumpy. But like nearly all state agencies and you know, so many other people around the state, we've had to adjust pretty quickly to this new reality without knowing exactly what the uh, semblance of normal uh, or normalcy might be and when that might be uh, returning. And then here we find ourselves on the final morning of our virtual board meetings. And as Mr. Jones indicated, we did have you know a few hiccups along the way, but I really appreciate the patience uh, of the board and the committees as, as the team really worked to address those problems as quickly uh, as they could. We had over 70 uh, people participating either in a committee meeting or in the board meeting this morning. And those 70 people have been distributed around not only the state of California, but we actually had people contributing from other states, including um, Mr. Bagson. So I would like to take a moment just to thank all of the teams uh, who have been instrumental in making the last three days happen. Uh, whether that's the IT team, uh, the Office of Public Affairs, the Board Services Unit, I uh, really appreciate all of their work. Um, in terms of our day-to-day -day operations, uh, we quickly, within the first two weeks of uh, the pandemic, were able to get uh, initially starting about 75% of our workforce uh, working remotely or in telework arrangements. Uh, you fast forward to today, in the last few weeks, we have approximately 85% of our employees successfully working in remote locations. We do have to keep about 15% of the workforce coming into uh, the headquarters building in Sacramento because the nature of their work uh, does not allow them to, you know, to, 
provide those functions in a remote location or from their homes. These would be individuals who are receiving mail, who are running the imaging system, uh, indexing those documents and getting them into the workflow so that the people working remotely from home uh, have work to do. So I really want to express uh, our strong appreciation for those members who are team members who are continuing to come in to the CalPERS building every single day. Uh, I, whether you know they have some anxiety about that, we've done our best uh, to alleviate as much of that as we can. And one of the things that we've done is really work closely with the uh, custodial crew, the security team, and they've just done an outstanding job of making sure that where we have people physically working, that we do extra cleaning, extra sanitizing of those work areas throughout the day, as well as a deeper cleaning into the evening. And while our employees are on site, they of course are practicing all the social distancing protocols that have been recommended by uh, local and state health officials. Um, each morning, the executive team, and we had this protocol in place prior to COVID-19, but each morning we have a huddle uh, of where the entire team gets together uh, for 15 to 30 minutes just to check in. Uh, we converted those huddles over to be purely about COVID-19 and CalPERS's response to all the various issues that come up every single day. And one of the things we wanted to do each morning was to get a report out on how the core processes were functioning or operating in this remote environment. And uh, so since then, we've actually created an automated way by which the executive team, they have a COVID-19 dashboard that takes care of primarily the processes that are facing our members. So those would be um, contact center statistics, uh, retirement uh, application processing, for example, just two examples there. Uh, so look, we do look at the call volume, um, and I'm happy to report that our service levels of paying 90% of retirement and survivor benefits um, is all done uh, very timely, and those numbers have continued to hold strong uh, during the remote working arrangement. And I think our teams have been really innovative. You know, sometimes it takes a crisis or something that you had not expected for innovation to really come in and solve that problem of the day. I'm just happy to report that we have a number of employees who are submitting ideas on a regular basis about how we can better serve the members or how we can have better connectivity uh, between the teams. So I'll just give you a little bit of the data. Uh, wait times for our customer contact center are on, on par with pre-COVID-19 um, levels and really have dropped significantly over the last week as a result of one employee idea, which I'll mention a little bit later. 45% uh, of our retirement applications are coming in and they're being filed through, <laughs> you can hear my dogs in the background, I'm sorry, uh, through my CalPERS. Uh, and that's really been an all-time high since my CalPERS was launched back in 2011. The Cal CalPERS health plans are ramping up telehealth uh, since many of the elective uh, procedures and uh, appointments have been uh, postponed. And as we talked about in pension and health, you know, one of the things that the committee wants us to continue to watch for is the data that would support that telehealth is a, an appropriate replacement for some of the on-site um, utilization. Uh, we've also followed through to ensure that CalPERS members in the HMO and PPO plans don't have any out-of-pocket expenses for COVID-19 testing, and then we'll also continue to coordinate with our pharmacy benefit manager, uh, OptumRx, to ensure that our members have all of the medications that, that they need. So the executive team, you know, we're really proud of the team at CalPERS and how productive they've been. You know, these are employees like uh, many of the committee and board members who are trying to balance their professional responsibilities along with these new personal responsibilities of uh, setting their kids up for virtual uh, online classes or education. And so we're really proud of the way that they've responded to it. So on the communication, uh, from the beginning, as I mentioned in our action plan, we made a very strong commitment to being as open and transparent as we possibly could on the communication front. Uh, what we found out right away, you know, the number one thing that our members were most concerned about is whether there would be any kind of disruption in their payments. And, you know, our stakeholders are concerned about being able, you know, the employer stakeholders are uh, concerned about being able to uh, pay their contributions and to report that timely. So we wanted to make sure that we had mechanisms in place and channels in place that we could communicate very proactively as new information or decisions were made by the organization that we were communicating that out to the stakeholder groups as quickly as we could. So one of the things uh, that we've done internally because teams, uh, our team members need to be kept very well informed. Um, I think sometimes in the absence of 
uh, strong communication or good communication, uh, that the gaps get filled with non-factual information or get filled with, you know, kind of people's stress and real negative views. So one of the approaches we had is that we wanted to stay in contact with the entire organization, all 2,800 employees on a daily basis, as well as uh, having the ability for uh, team members to ask questions directly uh, to me, either through an email, and then also every Friday I now do a live uh, web chat where people can send in their questions and I'll address those in a more live format. And that seems to be working really well for uh, not only the connectivity side of it, but just keeping the anxiety and stress levels at least around the part of their uh, lives that has to do with CalPERS and their job, keeping you know information out there I think has really been helpful, at least based on the feedback uh, that I've heard. And then we've also had a number of team members who have tried to, you know, do more community support. We have at least two individuals who I know about who are making maps, uh, Fritzy out of our actuary, uh, actuarial office, as well as uh, a, a member of our health team. Uh, they, uh, from their homes, are trying to support the community by, you know, making maps, uh, dropping those maps off either at CalPERS for the people who are working on site or uh, donating those to healthcare facilities or to other organizations where the shortages have really been impactful. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of uh, direct access back to our website. Uh, we put out a frequently asked questions. Uh, we sent out uh, a member email blast. Uh, again, just addressing the general questions that were coming into the contact center. Those seem to be the open rate on that email was extremely high. The visits coming into the website, uh, we had 92,000 visits in March. Uh, that's about uh, double the number for, from prior months, and you'll see that in the data that we provide you. And then also we're seeing a big spike in how the users are coming into the website. Uh, according to our data, uh, direct traffic to our site has almost doubled. And what this means is that we have people actually typing in calpers.ca.gov to go directly there and not coming in from another source. And then on the employer side, as we said, um, we try to keep them tightly in the communication loop as much as we can. We've been doing a number of circular letters out of our employer accounts management division. Uh, that's Renee Ostrander's group. And you know, as executive orders are coming in uh, from the governor, we want to make sure that we can help the employers understand how those executive orders relate to the business of CalPERS. And so those circular letters have been going out, um, and and the views on those circular letters circular letters are up by 200%. And then, you know, as far as webinars, a couple of weeks ago, we did host an employer webinar. We had over 1,700, between 1,700 and 1,800 attendees. And we had a number of the employers send in their questions in advance so that we could make sure that we address those more directly, uh, not just in the way that we communicated verbally, but also we had put together a number of charts and graphs. Uh, sometimes seeing it in a picture is easier to understand than to hear, you know, someone talking at you for an hour. Uh, we did get uh, positive feedback um, on it. We had several of our executives who participated in it. Um, Michael Cohen, our chief financial officer, Dan Bienvenu, uh, Scott Tarando, our, our, our actuary, uh, Brad uh, Pacheco out of our communications office was the facilitator. And then I just did uh, a couple of opening remarks. We had three of uh, our board members who, at the end of the Q&A period, had an opportunity to address directly some of the questions that the attendees had. I thought that worked extremely well. And, um, and we have Renee Ostrander uh, on as well. And you know, what's really important about you know, Renee and, and her team is they get into the really technical questions. And so what we found is that there were a number of general questions about board actions and policies and risk mitigation policy and asset liability management. But then they quickly went into, well, how do I treat this from a reporting standpoint? So Renee did a really nice job of explaining um, how employers could do that and really encouraging people to stay in contact with us if they had any questions that, you know, we're here to serve them, we're, they, we consider them a partner in, in the way that we administer these benefits and we want to be readily available uh, to them. So just moving on to health, as you heard yesterday, our health teams are working with the health plans, plans on the premiums for 2021. Um, the process is moving forward. Um, you know, we're using our data warehouse uh, to really look at the claims data and, you know, as we're getting uh, rate, uh, rates coming in, you know, we can do some validity testing on our end as well. That I think that's been really helpful. Uh, the team is working to bring rates back to the committee in June on the normal timeframe, but 
there could be some uh, delays, as was noted in the PHBC meeting. On the budget, uh, you did, uh, the Finance and Administration Committee did hear the fiscal year budget uh, yesterday, and this does include a nearly 11% reduction in overall expenses, while we also allocated additional funds to support strategic initiatives around disaster recovery, around information security, and then the total fund data strategy. And that really helps us to uh, be able to manage these uh, assets in-house uh, more effectively. The majority of the 11% reduction, about 200 million, comes from eliminating approximately 30 external investment managers. And this is the work that the investment team has been doing of moving some of our active mandates over into a more passive mandate. And then we're also able to capture another 9 million in savings related to healthcare administrator fees. And then in terms of organizational efficiencies, we did take steps to reduce the number of our temporary health positions while the number of enterprise-wide positions remains flat. Uh, this will be the fourth year that the, that number has remained flat. And uh, that number is uh, 2875. And then finally, you know, I'm pleased to talk about one of our highest forms of recognition that we do here at CalPERS called the APEX Award. APEX stands for Achieving Performance Excellence. And this week, uh, actually this morning, we announced that there are 18 team members in this uh, year's class of recipients. And one of the things I think we all like most about the award is that all of the nominees are nominated uh, by their colleagues or their fellow teammates. And then recipients were recognized for the work they've done in the last year that was consistently above and beyond what the normal expectations of that position might entail. And then we'll find a way to celebrate uh, this year's class of recipients at a later date. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to offer my congratulations to, to them all. Now, normally we would have had them stand up in the auditorium. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do that uh, this time. But at our regularly, our next regularly scheduled meeting that we're able to have an auditorium, we'll make sure to invite those recipients for your recognition as well. And then before I report the investment performance, I'd like to address what to expect with the upcoming CalPERS events. Uh, the CBs, the CalPERS Benefit Education events in May and June, have been canceled and we're now looking at whether we hold the July and August events. Right now that is uncertain. As for the next board meeting scheduled for June and the board offsite in July, we don't know yet what those will look like, but we're certainly hoping that we can get everyone back into the auditorium in June or uh, July. Uh, we will look to state and local guidance as we have been, as we've been uh, really coordinating closely and then creating our action plan uh, to stay in alignment. And then finally, the investment performance uh, year to date, uh, it, and this would be performance as of March 31st, uh, 2020, uh, the fiscal year to date return is a negative 4.1. The one year return is negative 0.4. The three year return is 4.6. The five year return is 4.7. The 10 year return is seven. And the 20 year return is five. And then to close today, we do have an inspirational video that I'm hoping will work. If it doesn't work, we will send you a link after. It's uh, fairly brief, but it's uh, this portrait that, uh, that really shares uh, and embodies public service. And it's the newest video in our We Serve California series. And what this says is it highlights public employees and the important work that they do. This one is about a state worker named um, May Lee. And I can't think of a better way to end this week uh, than on her story, which exemplifies what it means, again, to truly serve the public for the number of years that this individual has. So, James, if we could roll that video, please. We didn't have computers. We didn't have cellular phones, calculators. In the old days, we had the contometer, which you manually have to push the dial, we didn't have air conditioning, we didn't have uh, uh, nice lighting. Now you just press the button electronically, it transfer from here to there. My name is May Lee, I work for Department of General Services in the Facility Management Division. I've been working for the state since 1945, which makes it 70, 70 years. I started public service way, way back when I was in high school, when I was a 
senior in high school, I worked in the principal's office. And I kept their ADA, which is the average attendant record for them. I was uh, raised and we went to the Alton or in a segregated school. My father had about seven ranches. So he taught me how to keep records of all the different ranches. I learned to run the backers and uh, add expense and keep track of the income. September 26, 1963, they called me up and said, your new department is called General Services. There was no accounting system set up. Through the year, I did all the county system for general service. One of the things I'm proud of is I'm able to figure out how to get out of the red into the black on the funding, such as the architecture revolving fund was 27 million in the hole. Even the order gave up. So I decided to take a shot at it and I figured out what's wrong. In five and a half years, we pulled it out. We were in a, in a flat now. There's an article 19 in the Constitution that said there was no Chinese to be hired in public uh, work. And I wrote to the uh, Senate and explained that that's in violation of the U.S. Constitution. So I uh, submitted and they asked me to visit the Senate with a special pass on May 12, 1945. In 1955, they repealed that section of the state constitution. You don't have to do crossword puzzles just to keep your brain. Volunteer, do something, and be active, and uh, keep moving around. <laughs> June 23rd, I'll be 100 years old, and I will have 77 years of state service as of June 7th, so that's a long span of time. <laughs> <laughs> Marcy? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jones. That concludes okay. my report. Thank you. I, I want, I, if we were in the auditorium, I would ask everyone to stand. What a remarkable story. So I'll just ask everyone to please applaud her for her years of service, okay? Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so now we will move back to the agenda. Uh, we go to the um, action President, item. Comment. Hello? I have a comment, Mr. President. Okay, who is that? This is Rob. Oh, okay, Rob. Go Thank ahead. you, sir. Uh, well, I certainly didn't want to have to follow that. Oh, what an amazing story. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> Frost, for sharing that. I think she and I, Ms. Lee and I had something in common. When I was a senior in high school, I was in the principal's office, too. This wasn't working. <laughs> uh, I do want to say that, uh, Ms. Frost, I want to uh, reach out and say to you what a fantastic job of leadership you've shown during these very, very difficult times. Uh, you brought your staff together and they're doing just yeoman's work. And I want to thank you and your entire staff through you uh, on the great work that they've been doing during these very, very difficult times. So thank you and your leadership and all those that are working for us during these, these trying times. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you and I'm sure Can the we... entire, I'm sure the entire board echoes that same message, Ms. Frost. So thank you again. So now we go to um, action item uh, six. Uh, we have two items there for action approval of the minutes from February and March and board travel. So Ms. moved. Who was that? Teresa. Okay, Ms. Taylor moved it. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? 
Uh, who was that? Did you hear the second one? Mr. Mr. Can we take the items separately? Huh? Can we take the items separately? This is Ms. Brown. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, hold on just a So let's uh, uh, back up and take these items separately. Withdraw that motion uh, on the package, and now we'll go back and uh, 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 take them separately. On item uh, 6A, uh, the, the uh, board uh, minutes. Do I have a motion? So move. Okay. Was that? Second by Ms. Brown. Okay, second by Ms. Brown. Who gave the motion? Ms. Taylor? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, yes. okay Ms. Hopper, would you take the roll, please? Okay, this is on item 6A. Yes. Margaret Brown? Aye. Rob Beckner? Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Moss? I don't know. That. Was that an aye? I don't think he can hear us. Frank, can you hear us? He's he he doesn't have sound. Okay, please. <laughs> Okay. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. David Miller. Aye. Thank you. you guys Stacey Oliver. Uh, thumbs up, please. Stacy. Thank you. Arena Ortega. Aye. Thank you. Jason Perez? Aye. Thank you. Ramon Rubicava? Aye, uh, yes. Teresa Taylor? Yes. Thank you. Sonda Wesley? Aye. Thank you. Lynn Packman for Betty Yee? Aye. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, can you uh, reconfirm? I have Teresa Taylor making the motion for item 6A and Margaret Brown seconding that? That is correct. Okay, and then now we're going on to item 6B, board travel approval, separate item. Yes. Please call. Would you like me to call roll call? Yes, please. Thank you. Margaret Brown. Oh, we have to take a motion for this one, please. Okay. Ms. Taylor, motion. I'll make a motion. Okay, moved by Ms. Taylor, second by Mr. Miller. No. Okay. David Ms. Miller? Uh, yes. Okay, Roll, Ms. Hunt. Margaret Brown. No. Rob Beckner? Aye. Fiona, uh, Frank Sertino for Fiona Moss. Thumbs up, please. David, thumbs up. No, Frank. Was that an aye? Aye. Frank. Thank you. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. Thank you. Casey Oliveris. Thank you. Irena Ortega. Thank you. Jason Perez. Thumbs up. Thank you. Ramon Rubicava? Aye. 
Thank you. Teresa Taylor? Aye. Shonda Wesley? Aye. Thank you. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee? Aye. Mr. President, I have 12 ayes, one no. Margaret Brown for item 60. Motion by Teresa Taylor, second by David Miller. Correct. Thank you, Ms. Hopper. And I asked the uh, board members if you would mute your mic until you're ready to speak because that's causing some of the background noise. So if you could do that, we may have a better uh, 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 ability to hear. Okay, so now we move on to item seven, uh, which is information consent items. And I have no request to move anything from there. So now we will go to committee reports and actions. And before I go to, um, we have a number of requests to speak on a number of these items. So before we go to Ms. Taylor, the chair of the investment committee to provide a report, we have a request to speak on this item. And so we will, we have, I understand somebody is in person in the auditorium and then we have uh, emails uh, on this item. Are they both in person? So Ms. Hopper, are they both in person? Yes, they are. Okay, so who is coordinating that? Uh, Mr. Jacobs, uh, Mr. Kelly in the auditorium? Yes, Kelly Fox will be addressing who's coming up. I believe okay. JJ and Al, Dar Al Darby. Okay, good. Uh, th this is JJ Jalonsek. Uh, I had asked to speak at the end rather than the beginning, but this is fine. On Monday, I witnessed the type of hyena collegiality that I have experienced so often. It was a rare display by the board. I commend Mr. Fechner and Ms. Taylor for having the integrity to identify their intended target. Mrs. Brown asked Mr. Ming how the system's left tail risk strategies worked in the corona meltdown. Mr. Ming replied that for the most part, they worked as planned. He failed to mention that they had that he had closed the largest hedge and was in the process of closing the other. On the Fechner timeline, this happened in February, so Mrs. Brown should be commended for asking about the hedge the week before the meltdown started, although she should be criticized for asking how it worked since the meltdown had not yet occurred, or it happened in March, as the date on the transcript and public comments suggest. April 9th, Bloomberg broke the story that CalPERS had lifted its hedge and missed an over $1 billion payday. The only CalPERS-related people quoted in the story were Andrew Jenkins and Ben Ming. CalPERS has not denied the report, requested a retraction, or put out another dollar figure. Margaret tried but failed to reach the CEO. She publicly then complained that even though she had asked about it, the board had not been informed that the hedge had been lifted. I have not heard any board member claim that that charge was inaccurate. The board is responsible and deserves to know what staff is doing in its name. Mrs. Brown was criticized for not talking to Ben Ming. Board policy forbids her for doing, from doing so. I know that some of Ms. Brown's critics know that because they criticize me for it often. I also know the policy is applied only to board members who are not part of the clique dedicated to protecting the CalPERS image at all costs. If there is any doubt, Ms. Brown is not in that clique. Her loyalty is to beneficiaries and not the system. She also had the temerity to line up support for her position on 7B. She should have known that only staff is empowered to solicit comment. In fact, she went so far in the words of Ms. Taylor, that she coerced members to make public comments, powerful lady. One should not be attacked for pointing out uncomfortable truths about the results or lack of accountability. Members deserve the truth. The board president says he is dedicated to transparency. Maybe you, sh you should try some. 
Maybe the PR shop should be reduced to fund internal controls. Thank you. And the next person, Ms. Sopper. Al Darby's coming up to the stand. Morning, Mr. Chair, board members, Al Darby, President, Retired Public Employees Association. Uh, this is uh, regarding the Margaret Brown uh, affair on uh, Monday in the Investment Committee meeting. The public attack on Margaret Brown was a clear violation of the proposed new code of conduct and certainly a violation of the universal code of civility. She has a right to communicate with constituents and association members in RPEA where she is a member. As long as no confidential helper's information is disclosed, she is entitled to an apology from any investment committee member who spoke against her uh, last Monday. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So that concludes the uh, request to speak on this item. So now I call on the chair, Ms. Taylor, to provide her report on the investment committee. Mr. Mr. President, we do have one other public comment on this item that is through an email. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take that now then. Mr. Kelly. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, there are no comments, additional comments on 8A. We're on uh, 8B will be the next one. Okay. Okay, thank you. So you know, go back to the Taylor for her report on the investment committee. Taylor. Thank you. Am I can, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. The um The investment committee, I'm sorry, it's really printed tiny. <laughs> the investment committee met on April 20th, 2020. The committee held an election for chair and vice chair positions. Teresa Taylor was elected chair and David Miller was elected vice chair. The committee recommends and I move the board approve the following. Agenda item 9A to approve the removal of Andrew Junkin as key person under the consulting agreement with Wilshire Associates and the substitution of Thomas Toth, Steve Foresti, and Ro Rose Dean and Ali Kazimi as the agreement's key persons going forward. On the motion, uh, uh, Ms. Monroe. Uh, Two motion that. Ms. Hopkins, Ms. Taylor on the committee motion. Okay, Margaret, uh, Margaret Brown. Aye. Rob Fechner. Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Moss. I think you said aye. Okay, Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. Stacey Oliver. Stacey Oliver. Thumbs up. The thumbs up. Irena Ortega. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubacava. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Packwin for Betty Yee. Aye. Okay, the item passes. Okay, uh, Ms. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Jones. The committee received reports on the following topics, an overview of the performance of CalPERS portfolio and the current economic situation, an update on global equities, corporate governance and proxy voting activities and plans for the upcoming proxy voting season, 
the chair directed staff to bring back an overview of the plan to mitigate financial risks president presented presented by COVID-19. The committee heard public comment on the following topics, the investment committee delegation, investment strategy and risk, and previous litigation. At this time, I'd like to share some highlights of what to expect at the June investment committee meeting, the mid-cycle review of the asset liability management decisions, and proposed changes to the total fund policy. The next meeting of the investment committee is scheduled for June 15, 2020 in Sacramento, California. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Uh, the next item is the Pension and Health Benefit Committee uh, report. Before I call on the chair, Mr. Fechner, I understand we have a request to speak on this item. So, Ms. Hopper, is it a mail in or in the auditorium? Yes, it's an email, and Kelly will start reading. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, Kelly Fox, CalPERS team member. This email is from Joanne Hollander uh, regarding the Preferred Provider Organization Health Plan Assessment. Hello, board members. I am a CalPERS ben pension beneficiary and a member of the Retired Public Employees Association. There are concerns about how the PPO PERS care basic plan premiums will be paid for in 2021. Since it is confidential, it is not known if a form of risk adjustment among the PPO plans and or the buy-down of remaining risk-based capital excess reserve funds will subsidize the PPO PERS care basic plan premiums for 2021 or not. More, most importantly, there is a need for a redesign of the PPO PERS care basic plan to ensure that adverse selection is finally addressed and that there is not detrimental, that it is not detrimental to the PPO Medicare plans and other PPO basic plans. Concerns are based on the following. According to the 2017-18 CAFR, quote, in June 2018, the board adopted buy-down proposals for the PERS care basic PPO plan and all Medicare PPO plans, end quote. From board actions, the PPO Medicare plans do not appear to have benefited from the buy-down of the risk-based capital excess reserve fund to reduce 2019 and 2020 premiums. The PPO PERS care basic plan received a significant majority of the excess reserve funds totaling 90 million, 46 million for 2019 premiums and 44 million for 2020 premiums. It should be noted that the overwhelming majority, per Kathy Donison, former Health Plan Administration Division Chief, of the excess reserve funds were generated by the individual PPO PERS Choice Basic Plan and the PPO PERS Care Medicare and PPO PERS Choice Medicare plans. As a stakeholder, I support the board and its staff to work with the stakeholders to ensure a fair and equitable redesign of the PPO plans, which are in the best interest of the majority of members in PPO health plans. End email. Okay, that's the only one, Mr. Kelly. That, in, that concludes their comments on item 8B. Okay, thank you. So now I call on the uh, chair, Mr. Fechner, to provide a report for the Health Benefits Committee. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Fox. The committee reelected Rob Fechner as chair and Ramon Rubacava as vice chair of the PHBC. The committee deferred agenda item 5B, review of the Pension and Health Benefits Committee delegation to the June 2020 PHBC meeting. The committee received reports on the following topic. The committee received information regarding the assessment of the preferred provider organization health plans and the retiree cost of, and the retiree cost of living adjustment for 2020. The committee also received public comment regarding agenda item 5B, review of the PHBC delegation. OptumRx is the pharmacy benefit manager and Delta Dental's out of network charges. The chair directed staff to continue to have CalPERS health plans waive copays and member cost sharing in regard to COVID-19. At this time, I would like to share some highlights of what to expect at the June PHBC meeting. The committee will review draft regulations for employment relationships, proposed revisions to the PHBC delegation, the 2021 health plan rates and state annuitant contribution formulas, and the CalPERS long-term care program competitive strategy. 
Next meeting of the PHBC is scheduled for June 16, 2020 in Sacramento, California. That ends my report, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Fechner. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Finance and Administration Committee. And I see that we do have requests to speak on this item. And I'm going to hear from the request of the speakers before we go to the chair, Ms. Taylor, to uh, provide a report. Uh, Ms. Hopper. Yes, JJ Jelensic and Al Darby will be in person. Okay. RPEA opposes the staff delegation uh, in the uh, Finance and uh, Administration Committee, uh, just as it did. Uh, it has the same objection uh, there as it does uh, to the Investment Committee uh, delegation, which was withdrawn on Monday due to the need to go back to the board uh, or back to the committee and the board to uh, determine if uh, board fiduciary duty is being usurped as it is in uh, other uh, proposals of this sort. Uh, that's all I have to say on that matter. Thank you. Welcome. Ms. Hopper. Yes, JJ is coming to this stand and to the mic right now. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, JJ Jelensic, and my comments are directed at agenda item five, the Treasury Management Policy. I assume that all my trustees have read the policy and the proposal, um, although I know what they say about assume. I just want to make clear on the record that this proposal puts staff in charge of the policy. It withdraws the committee's right to accept or reject changes. Because there is no committee action, there will be no report to the board. It's a board decision whether it wants to do that or not, but it should be very clear that you're giving up your right to reject changes on the Treasury management policy. Thank you. Okay, I understand. We have uh, two emails, Ms. Hopper. Mr. Kelly. We do have two email items, but Al Darby is requesting to come back up to the day off to speak again. Did he, ex did he, did his three minutes expire, Mr. Kelly? They did not. Okay, go ahead and let him up to three minutes. This is a separate item regarding the uh, Finance and Administration Committee. Uh, this deals with the uh, time, uh, or the look back time that uh, the proposal in uh, the candidate statement asked for in items other than number one. Number one has a five year limitation. The other uh, request for information from the uh, candidate, uh, there are three or four other uh, uh, items that uh, they want information about. In those other items, there's no look back. Uh, uh, statute of limitations. It, indiscretions years ago uh, that have not been repeated uh, within the last five years would seem to me to be uh, irrelevant and should not be considered. In other words, the five-year limitation that they put on item number one should be on each of the other items that they uh, request information for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have two submissions by email. The first is from Stephanie Hugh. Please reference item number, then ask the questions in bold. These are the directions she's giving to me, and uh, do not read the section, only the letter to identify. Uh, ask all questions, and then they can reply. Thank you. So, 
we have uh, what is the relevance of agenda item 70 attachment one page one of six on the finance and admin agenda item about the past five years what is the relevance of this and why five years back are current board members subject to this rule the next question uh, is regarding the subject to any legal or employment action on the grounds of discrimination or sexual harassment why is there no time limit on this statement without it seems that it would go back endlessly explain to who again our current board members subject to this as well and then lastly on do you have any conflicts of interest that would impact your role as a CalPERS board member the question define conflicts of interest our current board members subjects to subject to this disclosure as well what will be done to elected board members under what authority will you limit an elected members duties those are the questions that have been submitted by Stephanie Hughes okay and email okay and, and the email okay go ahead I'm sorry go ahead and the last one here on this item is from Anthony Butka I am submitting public comment on the finance and admin committee's recommendations to the board on the treasury and management policy agenda item 5d attachment 2 of their agenda urging the board to reverse the committee's recommendation and retain the old in parentheses current policy the changes to this policy adopted by the committee eliminates any committee review of staff recommended changes to the policy and significant strategies and further eliminates the committee's role in review for approval staff recommendations for changes to policy these changes will functionally eliminate the committee's role in any meaningful fiduciary oversight of staff in their management of CalPERS assets and investment programs benefit and structural changes and economic conditions this is yet again a further abdication of the board's fiduciary oversight of CalPERS staff as they do not as they do what they will with the funds which pay for our pensions with virtually no real input end email and that concludes the public comment for item 8c okay thank you uh mr kelly i think it, it would be important for staff to uh provide some information to uh the, those members on this policy because as I recall that it still will be presented to the board to approve or disapprove the changes. So if staff can follow up and provide them with the accurate information on that particular item, I appreciate it. Okay, so no further questions, no further requests there, Mr. Kelly. Not for this item. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we go to the uh chair of the uh, finance committee. Uh, Ms. Taylor, and before I call on Ms. Taylor, uh, I, I plan to, there are nine items uh, uh, in this action, uh, and rather than taking a yes, no vote on every one of them, I'm going to ask Ms. Taylor to read them all, and we will take one vote, so we won't have to go back and forth on our yes and no questions. However, if any board member would like any of these to be separated for a comment or to be able to vote no or to be able to abstain, you can let me know. I do have a request from Ms. Brown to remove 5D and E uh, from the uh, uh, committee's report and act on those separately. So are there any other uh, uh, board uh, items that board members would like to remove from the before I ask Ms. Teller to proceed with the, those items. Mr. Chair? Yes. I actually want a discussion with staff on 5D and E, not just a vote. I want to have a, a comment and a staff yeah, discussion. Yeah. I'm pulling Perfect. up. I'm pulling. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So are there any others? So I don't hear any other requests. So Ms. Taylor, will you read items, the rest of the items in that action item? <laughs> And then we will take a vote on those and then we'll return for discussion on the ones Ms. Brown asked for. Okay? Ms. Taylor. Certainly. Certainly, Mr. President. The Finance and Administration Committee met on April 21st, 2020. The committee recommends, and I move the board approve the following 
agenda item 5B, approve the April 2020 prospective report of solicitation contracts, purchase orders, and letters of engagement. Agenda item 5C, approve the 1959 survivor benefit actuarial valuation report as of June 30th, and the corresponding transmittal letter to the governor and legislature, adopt the employer and employee monthly premiums for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. Agenda item 7A, approve the 2020 and the 2021 annual budget in the amount of $1.694 billion and 2,875 positions. Agenda item 7B, approve the proposed election board member percentages of time to be elected board member percentages of time to be spent on board related duties based on the board committee selections held in February 2020. Agenda item 7C, adopt the employer and member contribution rates for the period of July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Item 7D, adopt an employer rate of 22.68% for the school's pool. Adopt a member contribution rate of 7% for the school employees subject to the Public Employees Pension Reform Act of 2013, PEPRA, for the period of July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. And agenda, and agenda item 7E, approve the proposed Board of Administration election regulatory changes expected to take effect January 1st, 2021 for the 2021 member at large election. You're muted, Henry. Okay, uh, on the items, uh, on the motion of the committee for the items that Ms. Taylor read, uh, would you please call the roll, Ms. Hopper? Okay, this I have for 5C, 5D, 7A, 7D, 7C, item 7D, and 7E. Margaret Brown. I believe that's incorrect, it's not 5D. Yeah, no, um, Ms. Hopper, it's it's yeah. item 5B, 5C, 7A, 7B, 7C, 7D, and 7E, which we is what we're voting on. Okay, okay Ms. Hopper. Can that one more time, Mr. President? Well, let me yeah. try. This is Matt Jacobs. I think what we've got is a problem with the B and the D sounding the same. So uh, <laughs> it's 5B as in boy, 5C, not 5D, not 5E, 7A, but yes, we're back on 7A, 7B, 7C, 7D, and 7E. Okay, good. Okay, on the motion of the committee, uh, Ms. Hopper, call the roll. Okay. Margaret Brown. Yes, uh, I'm a no on 7B and 7E. Yes, on all the others. Excuse me, that's not the way that it, it's going to work. If you've got a no vote on 7B and 7E, we need to take those separately. Thank you. Okay, so, so we'll hold 7B and 7E for a subsequent vote. So all the others remain. So continue on, Ms. Hopper. So let me restate the motion for clarity. I think uh, we have item, this is to approve item uh, 5B as in boy, 5C, 7A, 7C, 7D only. Correct. Okay, Ms. Hopper. Margaret Brown. Aye. Rob Fechner. Aye. Frank Rossino for Fiona Moss. I can't, I can't hear. Oh, thank you. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller.
For the record, Mr. <laughs> Rafino and Mr. Miller both indicated I vote. AC Oliveris. AC Oliveris voted I. Arena Ortega. I. Jason Perez. I. Ramon Rubacaga. I. Lisa Taylor. I. Shonda Wesley. I. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. I. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now Ms. Hopper, let's take the vote on seven, item 7B, seven as in boy. Roll call, please. Item 7B, Margaret Brown. Can you tell me the title of 7B, Mr. Chair? Approve the proposed elected board member percentage of time to be spent on board related duties based on board and committee selections held in February 2020. Thank you. I vote no. Okay. Rob Beckner. Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Moss. Thumbs up. Frank Rufino said agrees to aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. David Miller. Aye. Stacey Oliver. Stacey Oliver. Aye. Irena Ortega. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubacava. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Aye. Okay, thank you. Item uh, 7B as in boy passes. Now I'll take the roll on item 7E, E as in easy. Ms. Hopper. Margaret Brown. Again, Mr. Chair, can you read that item? I'm sorry, my board diligence is down, so I'm okay. not looking. I'm going okay. blind. Thanks. Okay. Approve the proposed Board of Administration and Election Regulatory Changes expected to take effect January 1st, 2021 for the 2021 member at large election. I vote no. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Hopper. Rod Fechner. Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma. Mr. Rufino voted aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. Aye. Stacey Oliveris. <laughs> Stacey. Stacey Oliver votes aye. Irina Ortega. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubacaga. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Packham for Betty Yee. Aye. Okay, thank you. The item passes. So now we would go back to agenda item 5D as in dog and uh, approve the treasury management policy. Ms. Brown, uh, you asked that that be pulled, so I call on you for discussion. Margaret Brown. No, 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 not yet, Ms. Hopper. This okay, is Mark, Ms. Brown asked that these to be pulled, so I'm giving her. Did you want to discuss any or do you just want to be able to vote no, Ms. Brown? Discuss them because um, I have a concern about, um, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, you were mistaken. The board no longer has approval over the Treasury policy. It's not the staff making a recommendation. 
and then the board gets to approve. Or actually with this change, the staff gets to make the changes. And then they tell us about them later. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have my, uh, my diligent isn't working, but it basically says, it takes away the part that says, um, review for approval staff recommendations for changes to the policy. We no longer make those improvements on either the treasury policy or on the treasury reserve policy. And I have a, a grave concern over that um, delegation. Can we call on Mr. Coyne to opine on that? Ms. Marcy, Ms. Frost? Yes, could we uh, promote Michael Cohen into the meeting, please? Okay, Michael, you should be able to turn your audio and video on. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can uh, hear me. Um, I just to correct for the record, uh, the only change being made on these treasury policies is right now the policies come to the board every single year if there's any changes recommended or not under the re recommended changes we would only bring them to the board and the staff is recommending a language change that being said the board return retains all of its powers over treasury management you guys can agendize the issue anytime you want and we're happy to discuss it um but we were trying to simplify the agenda is going forward so you don't have to approve items that have absolutely no changes on them. So uh, the only difference will be that uh, it will only come to you when we recommend changes. That being said, you have the full power as the policy lays out to oversee Treasury management. I think the key language, if you look at attachment three, page six is it says the committee shall review the policy and significant strategies related to calipers as treasury management when staff recommends changes that being said obviously the board and the committee have authority to uh discuss this matter anytime they they choose and we're happy to do that okay. uh, th thank you uh, mr cohen that you just made my point because before the staff would approve it and now you're just going well, now we're just going to review it uh, and that's the question, because you do, you take approval out of the language. I don't have it in front of me, but I know it was the word approve was stricken out. We're, we would bring you changes and review and approve them. And we're happy to, if you want that yeah. work, and, uh, Mr. Chair, that was absolutely our intent. If you want to <laughs> add in to and approve the policy, that's exactly what right. we meant. So if it, it makes a... Uh, Board Member Brown, uh, more satisfied, please uh, take that as a friendly amendment. Okay, and I think we will take that as a friendly amendment. So that's what we'll be voting on. Okay, Mrs. Hopper, any other questions, Ms. Brown? No, nope. if it's, I'm sorry, both oh, for no, five. No, yeah, sorry, both thing. five D and E. Yeah, okay, it's the same. So then you know, we don't need to discuss the other one now because the same changes will be made. Okay, good. So now we're voting on five. Uh, D as in dog and five E as in easy. Mrs. Hopper. Mr. Jones. Yeah. Uh, Matt Jacobs here. What I would suggest is to clarify what this motion is. Uh, it's to approve as indicated, except with the revision uh, that Mr. Cohen stated. Uh, Mr. Cohen, do you want to just state that again? Sure. So it's approved as drafted with the addition of review and approve in the locations uh, of any staff recommended changes. Okay. And um, since this is a motion by committee, uh, we need a, a second on that. We need a we need a, we need a motion and a second on that. Okay. We'll call on the chairman. <laughs> So I make a motion on 5D and 5E as uh, friendly amended by Michael Cohen to add the language approve. Okay. And we need a second. Second. 
Who was that? Uh, Rob. Okay, second by Mr. Rob. Okay, so we're voting on those two with, is that fine, Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Okay, okay, Ms. Hopper. Oh, I'm sorry. Good point. Ms. Hopper makes a good point that we need a second on that. We did, right. Mr. Fechner. Okay, very good. All row, Ms. Hopper. Mar Margaret, Re Margaret Brown. Aye. Rob Fechner. Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma. Frank Marino, aye. Lisa Middleton, aye. David Miller, David Miller says aye. Stacy Oliveris, Miss Oliveris, aye. Irena Ortega, aye. 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 Jason Perez, aye. Ramon Rubacava. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Packman for Betty E. Aye. Okay. Thank you. The item, those two items is are approved. Okay, Ms. Uh, Taylor, you may continue your report. I almost forgot about it. <laughs> All right. So the committee received reports on the following topics, semi-annual financial report for the PERF, semi-annual health plan financial report. The chair directed staff to provide the most recent CEM data on the investment offices, offices comparison to peers in terms of cost data. The committee heard public comment on the following topics. No, no public top comment was made. At this time, I'd like to share some highlights of what to expect at the September Finance Administration Committee meeting. Annual discharge of accountability for uncollectible debt policy. Annual actuarial valuation terminated pool, agency pool. Annual pre-funding program report and annual stakeholders perception survey. The next meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee is scheduled for September 15, 2020. And with this, um, my report is finished, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, Ms. Taylor. We will now go to um, item. Mr. President? Yes. <clears throat> I have a question for Mr. Cohen. Okay. Maybe, maybe Teresa. Uh, I, I may have heard it incorrectly when you initially, the um, proposal for the budget, I thought I heard 1.89 billion. I, I can address that. I can address that. The uh, 1.89 was for uh, 1920. Uh, the proposed is 1.69. Okay. Thank okay, you. thank you. Okay, so now we will move to the next uh, report, which is the Performance Compensation and Talent Management Committee. On that, I call on the chair, Mr. Fector. Thank you, Mr. President. The Performance Compensation and Talent Management Committee met on April 22nd, 2020. The committee received a report on the following topic. An overview of the CalPERS Employee Engagement Survey. The chair directed staff to include additional demographic data for the next CalPERS Employee Engagement Survey and to identify additional support for the investment office. At this time, I would like to share some highlights of what to expect at the June Performance Compensation and Talent Management Committee meeting. The committee will receive a status report on a request for proposal for the board's primary executive and investment compensation consultant. The committee will also review and approve the 2020-21 incentive plan of the chief executive officer and incentive metrics. The next committee of the Performance Compensation Talent Management Committee will be scheduled for June 16, 2020 in Sacramento, California. That concludes my report, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fackner. The next report is the risk and risk and audit report. And I get, um, would you mute your mic because I can, <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the next report is the risk and audit report. And before I call on the chair, Mr. Miller, I would just like to indicate that included in the report 
is a request to establish a subcommittee and the governance policies of the board indicates that the president is responsible for establishing subcommittees. So I'm indicating that I plan to establish a subcommittee in accordance with the request of this uh, report uh, from Mr. Miller. So with that, Mr. Miller, would you please uh, provide the report on the risk and audit committee? Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is this microphone working? Okay, good. Yeah. I will keep my fingers crossed. So um, the risk and audit committee met on April 21st, 2020. The committee recommends and I move the board approve the following. Agenda item 6A, 2020, 2021 enterprise compliance plan. Approve the 2020 to 2021 enterprise compliance plan. Do we do these separately? Yeah. Okay, so we'll do them both then. And the second item is item agenda item 6B, the 2020 through 2021 enterprise risk management plan. So approve the 2020 through 2021 enterprise risk management plan. So those are the, the two agenda items this motion would ask you to approve and it's a committee motion. So, um, Okay. Uh, yeah. On the uh, on the uh, recommendations of the committee, a motion of the committee. Mrs. Hopper, please call the roll. Margaret Brown. Aye. Rob Fickner. Aye. Frank Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma. Aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. Aye. Stacey Oliveris. Stacey Oliveris, aye. Irena Ortega. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubacaba. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Honda Wesley. Aye. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Aye. Okay, thank you. The item passes. Uh, continue to report, Mr. Miller. Okay, the chair directed staff to create an exception report which tracks audit findings remaining open beyond the audit resolution policy requirements and provide a list of key CalPERS internal committees and their memberships to be delivered through the insight tool. At this time, I would like to share some highlights of what to expect at the June risk and audit committee meeting. The 2020 through 2021 Office of Audit Services Plan, the Independent Auditors Annual Plan, the 2019 through 2020 Annual Compliance Report, and the Enterprise Risk Management Framework Review. The next meeting of the Risk and Audit Committee is scheduled for June 16th, 2020 in Sacramento, California. That concludes my report, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, for the next uh, committee report is the Board Governance Committee. And for that report, I call on the Vice Chair, Ms. Milton. Thank you, Mr. President. The Board Governance Committee met on April 22, 2020. The committee held an election of the Board Governance Committee Chair and Vice Chair. Henry Jones was elected Chair. Lisa Middleton was elected Vice Chair. The committee recommends and I move that the Board approve the following. Agenda Item 7A, approve the proposed schedule change for the Board's next self-evaluation to 2021 Agenda item 7B, approve and adopt the proposed code of conduct. On the motion of the committee, Mrs. Hopper, please. Can we have a separate vote on that, Mr. Jones? Okay, we sure can. Let's take item 7A, approve the proposed schedule change for the board's next self-evaluation for 2021. On that motion, Ms. Hopper, please. 
Margaret Brown. Aye on 7A. Thank you. Rob Seckner. Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma. Aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. David Miller, aye. Stacey Oliveris. Stacey Oliveris, aye. Irena Ortega. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubacava. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty E. Aye. Okay, that item passes. Now we will move to agenda item 7B. Approve and adopt the proposed con code of conduct. Ms. Hopper. Margaret Brown. No. Rob Seckner. Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma. Aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. Aye. Stacey Oliveris. Stacey Oliveris, aye. Irena Ortega. Jason Perez. Aye. Ramon Rubacava. Aye. Teresa Taylor. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Aye. Okay, thank you. The item passes. Now we will move on to agenda item nine. Uh, and before we move to this, I would like to know if Sherrod Shar, the board's independent counsel on administrative uh, hearings, is uh, in uh, communicated as he uh, online. So in the event there are questions. Yes, Craig has been added to the meeting, and, or Shirag, I'm sorry. Um, Shirag, can you go ahead and try your video and up? Mr. President, does Ms. Middleton finish your report? Oh, I guess not. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Factor. So, thank Ms. You, uh, Ms. Middleton? President, and thank you, Mr. Factor. Uh, it, this will be quick. The committee also received two reports, an update on the recent developments in the Workstream 5 implementation of the board's insight tool and a comparison of the California legislature's approach to the handling of allegations of harassment to the CalPERS approach. The next meeting of the board governance committee is tentatively scheduled for June 16, 2020 in Sacramento, California. Thank you and that does conclude my report. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Milton. I, Ms. Milton, I apologize for that. Okay, no. so we do have Mr. Sherrod Shaw on the phone. So I now call on the Vice President, Ms. Taylor, on this proposed decision of administrative law judges' actions. Ms. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to adopt the proposed decisions at, ag at agenda items 9A1 through 11 and 13 through 17 as the board's own decisions with the minor modifications argued by staff to agenda items 9A2, 3, 9, 11, 16, and 17, and remand agenda item 9A12 for the taking of additional evidence regarding whether an actual termination from employment for cause without the possibility of reinstatement is required before a member may be deemed ineligible for an industrial disability retirement, and if so, whether the notice of intent con con constitutes such actual termination from employment. 
Okay, this can be by Ms. Taylor. Do we have a second? second. I got Mr. Miller. Oh, Ms. Brown, there you go. Okay, second by Ms. Brown. Okay, Ms. Hopper. Margo Brown? Uh -huh. Rob Beckner? Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma? Aye. Lisa Middleton? Aye. David Miller? Aye. Stacey Oliveris? Aye. Irena Ortega? Aye. Jason Perez? Aye. Ramon Rubacaba? Aye. Teresa Taylor? Aye. Shonda Wesley? Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee? Aye. Okay, the item passes. Ms. Taylor? I move to deny the petition for reconsideration at agenda item 9B1 through 4. Okay, move by Ms. Taylor. Do we have a second? Move by, second by Mr. Fett. Okay, Ms. Hopper. Margaret Brown? Aye. Rob Fechner? Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma? Aye. Lisa Middleton? Aye. David Miller? Aye. Aye. David, Stacey Oliveris? Aye. Irena Ortega? Aye. Jason Perez? Aye. 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 Ramon Rubacava? Aye. Teresa Taylor? Aye. And funny, Jason. Shonda Wesley? Aye. Lynn Packman for Betty Yee. Aye. Thank you. The item passes. Thank you. Uh, so now, we, now we go to information agenda items. We have the state and federal legislation update. Mr. Brown. Mr. President, this is Matt Jacobs. Before you move on, if I might just make a statement for the record about this voting. Okay. Uh, if Ms. Hopper has recorded an I vote instead of the board member, her or himself, uh, stating that it is because uh, Ms. Hopper has confirmed um, a physical indication on the screen by that board member that that is the way that that board member uh, has voted. Just thought it was important to get that on the record uh, because a dry record later on may not reflect why it is that Ms. Hopper was saying aye for the board member. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that, okay. Um, okay, so proceed to Mr. Brown. And by the way, I'm looking at the chat box. Did I miss you, Mr. Perez, on a request to speak at any time? No, I, I interrupted him. And okay. okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Brown. David, Jared, can you uh, promote Danny Brown, please? Okay, I heard the request for Sherrod earlier, but I didn't get Danny. Danny is on the line and showing his video. I'm there. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, board members. Uh, before I get started, I do I would like to ask the host if they could also promote um, 
Krishma Page from Kano Gates, who will assist on the federal update, along with Dan Binvenu and Kent Crocker, who will provide technical assistance uh, if needed. Um, so, starting with the state, uh, state legislature has been on recess since mid March. Uh, they're scheduled to reconvene uh, on May 4th. Uh, Probably like most state agencies and ourselves, so we'll wait to see if that really happens as we get more uh, input from our elected uh, public of, of health officials. Um, it, it is very possible that that date will get uh, pushed out. Um, and uh, undoubtedly, right now, the legislative uh, timelines and calendars are in flux, and we're still waiting to see if they're going to hear the bills that are, uh, you know, non-COVID related. Um, leadership and the committees have really been uh, pressing members to. Reduce their, their bill load and only concentrate on those items that are critical uh, or urgent. Um, that said, we're continuing in contact with our uh, consultants and you know moving forward with our two sponsored bills as if they will move forward. Housekeeping bill AB 2101, as well as uh, AB 2473 dealing with uh, private loans. Um, so I think as we as we Get a better idea of when they actually return to work, how much time they have to work on bills, and have a better indication of the likelihood of those bills moving forward. I think right now it's probably 50 50, and the longer they stay out, uh, the less likely uh, those bills will move forward. It's very possible that they'll just come back to work on the budget in June. Uh, and then once the budget is passed, uh, maybe recess again until August and come back when they have a better idea of what the tax receipts are and do any adjustments uh, to the budget as well as any other. COVID 19. So um, that's kind of where we're on, on, on state legislation. It's kind of a wait and see. Um, and with that, I'm going to um, move to the federal update. But before I turn it over to Krishma, I did just want to mention that um, we have sent out about uh, five letters uh, since the last um, update. In February, um, I'm getting a lot of I'm getting a lot of triangles. So hopefully, you guys can still hear and see me. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there we go. I'm going to keep going. Um, so we've sent out two letters uh, at the end of February to the House Financial Services Committee uh, in support of two bills. Uh, HR uh, 5930, the Workforce Investment Disclosure Act of 2020, and this would require um, companies to disclose information around human capital management. And then on HR 5929, the Shareholder Political Transparency Act of 2020, and this would require SEC to adopt rules around companies reporting on their political spending. Uh, also send a letter to uh, congressional leadership around ending surprise medical billing, billing is something we've talked about a lot. Uh, this letter kind of follows up on a um, pill briefing that Marta Green uh, participated in, which was very successful, as well as some very productive meetings we had with uh, leadership while we were there on, on, on this issue. Uh, we were encouraged that something was happening. Obviously, the uh, pandemic has thrown a wrench in a lot of things in DC. Um, there's still a chance that uh, surprise billing could end up in the next uh, stimulus bill. Uh, if not, probably looking at uh, sometime in mid-November. And then we've also sent a comment letter uh, to the PCA PCAOB uh, expressing our support for your proposal to revise quality control standards uh, that provide a framework for accounting firms to perform high quality uh, audits. And so all of these uh, letters are uh, on our website. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to uh, Karishma to kind of finish the federal update. Great. Uh, greetings, uh, uh, Chairman, and to the board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, it certainly has been an extraordinary time, and uh, DC has been spending a tremendous amount of time, as it's been well reported in the press. Uh, focused on what uh, the COVID response needs to be, both from a health and economic perspective. Uh, the analogy that I continue to use is that we are building this in the air, and that's really a reflection of the fact that 
it is hard to judge the trajectory of the pandemic and what its impact is going to be, uh, both from a health and economic perspective, and certainly um, as uh, many state and localities make decisions about uh, when to come back online. Uh, just to sort of think back in terms of what's happened in the short amount of time uh, that uh, that uh, this, this pandemic has come underway. Um, I reflect back to just on March, uh, early March, we were looking at uh, the primary season and it had really significant questions of what was gonna be happening that was sort of taking up a lot of time and energy. Uh, and then very quickly, as it became clear uh, that the pandemic was starting to take, take hold, uh, the first real action from the federal government was March 6th, which was the phase one uh, part of the COVID response, which was largely just ensuring that there was some infusion uh, of appropriations to the key agencies that would be responsible uh, for the COVID response. The, the more significant piece of legislation was phase two. Uh, this was enacted on March 18th. So just nearly uh, two weeks after the first package. Uh, and this was really focused on uh, ensuring that there was some testing uh, some testing mechanism for COVID-19 and really focusing in on paid emergency leave uh, and employer tax credits that were really focused on uh, small employers uh, and ensuring that uh, those individuals that were impacted uh, from a workforce perspective would either have necessary leave and then therefore, and then that coverage for the small businesses that would also be impacted. Um, meanwhile, on uh, March 23rd, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, announced that it would establish three liquidity facilities. And these are our facilities that were existing under the Federal Reserve's 13-3 emergency authority. Uh, and these were focused on primary market corporate credit, uh, secondary, secondary market corporate credit, and the TELF, which has been, um, these are facilities that have been in place for some time, but have been emergent from the Federal Reserve's economic response. Shortly thereafter, uh, we saw the enactment of the CARES Act. Uh, this was on the 27th of March. Uh, this was the $2.2 trillion uh, bill that is focused on the, uh, not only the health aspects, this was the first real infusion of capital, it's $100 billion uh, into the healthcare industry to be able to respond uh, on COVID, but also on the economic side. Again, a real plus up on unemployment insurance benefits uh, for those that have been unemployed. Uh, and then um, also from the uh, business perspective, uh, pretty significant infusion of capital into the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which was focused on employers of under 500. And uh, under this program, a significant amount of those loans could be forgivable if used for payroll. Uh, another significant facility that was established is what's being referred to as the emergency uh, loan facility under uh, 4003B of the CARES Act. Uh, and this was really focused on mid-sized employers and larger employers uh, and came, is, becoming, is coming online as uh, related to a response from the Federal Reserve uh, that, uh, that was expanded on, upon, on, on April 9th, excuse me, um, so they have, we have a new Main Street facility for those mid-sized employers, as well as a uh, municipal, municipal liquidity facility, um, along with some other programs that the Federal Reserve is putting in place. Um, and here we are, um, sort of on the eve of what will be known as phase 3.5, uh, the Senate yesterday, um, after significant negotiations between, on a bipartisan, bicameral basis and with the White House, came to an agreement on a 3.5 package. This is largely a package that pluses up the dollars that were contemplated and have run out in certain instances um, in the CARES Act package or phase three. Um, a portion of this $100 billion of it will go back into the healthcare system. Uh, an additional 25 billion is being uh, allocated for uh, COVID uh, related testing uh, that will also be available to state and local governments that are going to be uh, on the front line, um, in addition to a cash infusion for the small business assistance program that I mentioned earlier that ran out of cash last week um, after being online just for just for a, a week or so. 
So um, we're already starting to talk about what phase four looks like. Uh, there will be um, certainly uh, a look at industry specific relief um, uh, where there have been gaps uh, from the previous uh, phases of relief. Uh, and what really, again, is needed to deal with the health and economic trajectory of COVID. Um, as Danny mentioned, uh, you know, there may be other issues that get incorporated like surprise billing. Surprise billing has had um, some level of interest as a result of what's been going on. Um, but, and we could see the space four really be expanded to include issues related um, to uh, sort of maybe adjacent to CalPERS issues, for instance, uh, multi-employer relief, um, some other types of retirement-related relief, tax-related relief, and perhaps some financial services-related relief as well. So certainly we'll be keeping a close eye on that. Um, I have received some intel just as we were on this call that uh, we may be seeing uh, an indication of where House Democrats are as early as uh, uh, before the end of the week. Uh, and that will be the beginning of a negotiation range. But of course, uh, one of the key questions is going to be uh, what it means for Congress to come back. Uh, right now, they're not scheduled to be back until May 4th, um, but Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, has, has indicated that there will be no new negotiations on a package until folks are back in D.C. and able to negotiate in person. So uh, a lot of open questions right now. Um, and uh, and certainly uh, we we see a lot of folks that are are working with Congress uh, uh, remotely, uh, but working with Congress to identify where the key priorities are going to be as we move forward. Um, and as you know, as Danny mentioned, I think this is all being juggled with priorities that that Calpers has been working on for some time. Others have been working on for some time. Uh, certainly right now what's before us is the pandemic piece, but we can anticipate that some aspects uh, of other issues will see their way into phase four or phase five or six as we move forward. Um, and with that, Danny, uh, happy to turn it back to you and of course answer any questions that folks may have. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Krishma. Mr. President, I think that concludes the report and happy to answer any questions on state or federal legislation. Okay, we do have a question from Mr. Rufino uh, on state, I think it is. Mr. Rufino? Mr. Rufino? Mr. President, Mr. President, I don't think you can call in. Uh, if you want, I can read his question for you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Rufino would like to know uh, if you can comment on State Bill 1067, the Morlock Pension Bond Bill. It's 1297, uh, I think. Yeah, 1297. Um, yeah, I don't. I the, when you say the um, that's is that the one that deals with the uh, peace officers' um, age of retirement, or is this a different Morlock bill? He said 1067 pension bonds, 1067. Yeah, I, I mean, my guess is I haven't um, heard anything about it. Early indication is the Senate is not likely to hear any pension related legislation, um, you know, unless it's really tied to COVID-19 and I don't, I don't believe that that would be so. Um, I don't think it has a chance. I don't think, I don't think it has much chance to moving forward, but I haven't heard much on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Rubalcaba. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I appreciate the presentation, uh, Ms. Page, on the uh, stimulus packaging. Uh, in referring to uh, what they call 3.5, I know there were local. You, you mentioned the local government will get some funding, but I. If you could elaborate, because I know um, the talk was that there will be funding for reimbursement of any um, expenditure for combating uh, the, the COVID virus. But I think but the um, what I'm sensitive to is the employers are losing sales tax and other revenues from which they use for general fund. And from that, of course, their contribution to the CalPERS as well as uh, their employees' contribution. So there have been uh, requests, I know, for many, uh, uh, for example, county organizations like CSAC and other local government 
to try to have some um, backfill of revenue. Is that going, has that been um, rejected still? If you could, and what are the prospects, Ms. Page? Thank you. Sure, that's, that's a very good question. One of the key areas of negotiation for the 3.5 bill has really been the question of relief for state and local governments. Um, that has been a core ask from the House Democrats in particular. Um, they had uh, requested $150 billion of funding for a wide range of relief given the impact that state and local governments are facing right now. Um, it, again, the negotiation had gone back and forth for some time, and the result in the current 3.5 package is what's being characterized as an interim measure, which is providing $25 billion for necessary expend expenses to expand capacity for COVID tests, and some of that includes funding, or that is including funding for state and local governments. So, unfortunately, at this time, the negotiation has resulted in the focus largely being just on testing. My sense is this, is that, uh, that the state and local government piece is certainly something that continues to be a top agenda item for, uh, in particular, the, the, the House Democrats. And um, I, I can imagine as we look at phase four, that's certainly going to be an area where there's going to be continued pressure. Um, and I think what will also be clearer is how different state and local governments uh, have been responding and also uh, what, um, you know, as the debate sort of takes over on when to, when to sort of bring, uh, when to sort of start dialing down stay at home orders, how they sort of play out, which has become, you know, a political issue in certain ways. So that's, that's a long way of saying, unfortunately, limited in 3.5. Um, but I do see this as a key area of negotiation as we move forward. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we before I call on Ms. Milton and go back to Mr. Rapino, he's indicating that the bill that he's referring to was introduced on February the 18th. Is that the same? You have the same response with that additional information, Danny? Well, I'm you know I'm I'm looking it up now, and um, I am not. This is not a bill. I was thinking of something else. So this is not a bill that I'm familiar with. So I would have to do some more research and okay. get back to you. This is not a bill that would end up in the purse committee. Looks like it's going to government and finance and really dealing with uh, local agencies. Um, okay, why don't we just take that as a part of the direction to follow up with the committee, sure. with the board, okay? Okay, Miss uh, Miss Milton. Okay, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, uh, I want to thank Mr. Rubaclava for uh, the question that uh, he asked. Uh, it goes to what now will be a comment from me. Uh, local government is uh, being absolutely hammered, uh, particularly municipalities uh, significantly rely on tourism taxes uh, and sales taxes for their survival and the economy has uh, has been crushing on us. Uh, so it is imperative if we are going to be able to meet our uh, pension obligation payments that there is relief from the federal government. Thank you. Response, any responses to Ms. Milton's comments? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't think we disagree. I know that, uh, and, and I apologize if, if uh, Ms. Page already had mentioned this, but you know, there is this municipal uh, um, uh, lending facility that, that the feds have opened up and um, they're getting a lot of feedback from members of Congress as well as governors and uh, legis legislators about the fact that it's limited to uh, large cities. In fact, I think I heard someone say that there's maybe less than 50 cities in the whole country that would qualify. And so there is a really a push to uh, reduce that that population number so that more uh, local governments can access that funding under the Fed window, as well as uh, getting additional uh, financing, um, direct financing from uh, a federal stimulus bill in the future. Most of the financing has been indirect, and so I think they really need some direct uh, help. And so I, we would agree, and obviously we would, 
you know, work with our partners, not only our, legis our, our, our lobbyists, but with other uh, pension groups to kind of have a concerted effort rather than just, you know, CalPERS on its own. Okay, thank you. Ms. Milton's. Okay, I'll, if she has an additional follow-up question, we'll come back to her. Uh, but I think uh, we got uh, Ms. Olivares. Can you bring Ms. Olivares in? Okay, she's now since she, oh, Miss Milton says she, she your point. Hello, is made up. okay, Miss Olivares, go ahead. All right, so <laughs> this is about SB 1067, and um, I'm just interested in learning more about the cap, the 40 year cap on the maturity date. You said on, on SB 1067 again, or? correct. Right, it has a not to exceed of 40 years on the maturity. Uh, yeah, I'll have to do some research because I am not familiar with that bill. It's not something that you know directly impacted CalPERS, so it's not something that we've been following real closely, but be happy to do some digging and get back to uh, the board uh, with some more analysis of that, that proposal. Thank you. I'd like to know the modeling behind that. So, as, as you know, it's very difficult for municipalities to afford their pension obligations. And so I'm wondering what happens if it's taken beyond the 40 year time limit. Okay. 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 Thank you. Right. You're welcome. Okay. So uh, see no additional questions for um, Mr. Brown. Are you finished with your report? Yes. I mean, I just wanted, I just wanted to add one thing to, I guess, to Lisa, uh, Lisa Middleton's comments, Ms. Middleton's comments. Um, you, you may have seen that the Illinois uh, legislature wrote a letter to uh, Congress asking for $10 billion to help with their pension payment. And it's gotten a lot of backlash um, and concern that it may impact their ability to get uh, funding because uh, the fact that you know many in Congress do not want money going to private or public pension plans. So I think uh, that's a concern going forward as we look at this uh, issue on how to make sure that state and local governments are getting money without harming them. Um, and so, obviously, we're, we're very um, focused on how that may, how, how we can help, but at the same time, we don't want to hinder their efforts. Okay, thank you. Okay, then um, I see we do have a uh, request to speak on this item. Uh, Ms. Hopper, is that uh, a email or in the auditorium? In person, JJ Jelinsic. Okay. Hello again. Uh, this is JJ Jelinsic, and I encourage you to withdraw your sponsorship of AB 2473. When you agreed to sponsor this bill, staff told you the language was not available, yet it was in print that very afternoon. The stated intent when staff asked you to sponsor this bill was to hide the borrower's confidential financial information that staff held. In fact, the bill hides all information about the borrower other than the name and address. It hides the underwriting. That doesn't help the borrower, but does hide the quality of staff's underwriting and makes the evaluation of the board's and your agent's action impossible. It hides the loan agreement and repayment terms. An unsecured $10 million 10-year loan with principal and interest due at maturity gets the same disclosure as a fully amortizing $10 million 10-year loan secured by a first mortgage on Pebble Beach. Does that make sense? Because the bill hides the loan agreement, it will hide any sweetheart deal. The system could make a loan to McClatchy with a term that says the loan is due and payable the first time they report something that embarrasses CalPERS. Unlikely, 
but so is a CEO accepting bags of cash. The bill hides information about collateral. The truth is an interest in collateral is only effective if there is a public filing. So this bill says that a public filing is exempt from disclosure. The bill provides that if private lending is contracted out, even this limited disclosure disappears. If staff decides it needs to hire a firm with, say, collection experience to run the program, it would get all the protection of private equity. You, the beneficiaries and the press, would not know what is going on. I point out that you disclose the existence of private equity fund, but not the content of that fund, which is actually kind of funny given that general partners normally put out a press release when they purchase or sell a company. It's also how you wound up owning the National Enquirer and legacy assets. Your bill has a very broad definition of private loan. It covers, among other things, all government securities, most mortgage-backed securities, all 144 and 144A securities. Please either demand amendments or withdraw your sponsorship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so then uh, that concludes the request to speak on this item that I have. Is that true, Ms. Hopper? On 10A, yes, it is. Okay, thank you. So then, so then we go to 10B, a summary of board direction. Ms. Frost, direction Ms. Frost. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, other than what came out through the committee summaries, I didn't record any additional direction. Uh, Danny's, there was a couple for Danny to follow up on. Uh, pardon me. Yes, to uh, follow up on Senate Bill 1067. Uh, sponsored by Morlock, and we'll provide an update to the board via email. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then we go to uh, public comment. We have a request to speak in, on public comment agenda item. Ms. Hopper? Yes, we have two emails. Kelly will okay. read. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Chair and board members, we have two comments. The first from Mr. Joseph P. Ruiz regarding public comment 8D information item agenda, agenda items Wednesday, April 22nd. Dear Board of Administration, what is my status on the complaint I filed against Belize Chapui and Renee Ostrander? Regards. In message. And lastly, uh, this message is from David Torres. Subject, public comment, April 22nd, 2020, CalPERS board meeting agenda, item 10. My name is David Sores. My comment is respectfully offered to the members of this honorable board in response to Mr. Fechner's public remarks directed at me personally on April 20, 2020. Mr. Fechner asked, quote, who gave you the ability, end quote, to comment on the qualifications of CalPERS staff. The constitutions of the United States of America and the state of California and the Bagley-Keene Open Meetings Act gave me that, quote, ability and that right. As previously stated, I am a CalPERS beneficiary, retired after 32 years as a prosecutor in Silicon Valley. I maintain numerous personal and professional contacts with persons who are credentialed experts in finance and public administration, relationships which I developed over my decades of active public service. CalPERS employs hundreds of hardworking staff, highly qualified people like the recently resigned Ronald Lagnato and Paul Muchaka, but they do not report directly to the board, to this board. The delegations that I feel compelled to question are to the chief executive officer and the chief investment officer. If you read the news, you will discern that I am not alone in questioning their qualifications or accountability. Are the seemingly ever increasing departures of highly qualified and experienced staff like Mr. Lagnato and Mr. Muchaka caused by the brief comments of mere beneficiaries or does the fish rot from the head? 
The question that I must now, with all due respect, ask before the members of this honorable board, honorable board is, who are you, in caps, to question my, in caps, quote, ability to make a public comment, Mr. Fechner? Have you, in capital letters, honored the letter and spirit of the constitutional requirement that, quote, a re retirement board's duty to its participants and their beneficiaries shall take precedence over any other duty, end quote, in providing honest services to the people of this state. Your gross overreaction to my recent public comment speaks volumes, sir. End message. And that concludes the public comment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Okay, the next item on the agenda is to uh, approve to approval to meet in closed session pursuant to government code section 11126C 18A. Move approval. Wait a minute. Second. I have Wait a minute, I haven't read it. Excuse me. This afternoon, we have two items in closed session. An information security update and cyber security briefing involving staff's work to protect the system and an update on litigation matters. In particular, we will receive updates on the litigation in the Sanchez v. CalPERS and an update on pending litigation. In order to hold a closed session to consider matters posing a potential threat of criminal activity or equipment, including electronic data, and where disclosure would compromise CalPERS and security, the Bagley King Open Meeting Act requires at least two thirds of the board to affirmatively vote in order to utilize this exception. Based on consultation with our legal office, Discussions concerning CalPERS's information security and cyber security qualifies for this closed session exception. After the closed session, the board will briefly report out an open session that we met under this exception and if any action was taken. What's the pleasure of the board? I'm looking for a motion and a second to meet in closed session for the information security update and cyber security briefing. Uh, do we have a motion? No. I make the motion. Okay, and I second. By, moved by Ms. Taylor. Was that Ms. Brown? Second it? Yes. yes. Okay. Moved by Ms. Taylor, second by Ms. Brown. Ms. Hopper, please call the roll. Margaret Brown? Aye. Bob Techner? Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma. Frank Aye. Potatoes. Thank you. Lisa Middleton. Aye. David Miller. Aye. Stacey Oliver. Aye. Serena Ortega. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. 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 Lisa Taylor. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Aye. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hopper. Okay, so we will join the uh, open session meeting and we will take a break for lunch and return at 1.15 and proceed into closed session at 1.15. Thank you and see you in a little bit less than an hour. <laughs>